Good morning, Crossroads. Welcome to uh, our worship service this morning. Come on in, find a seat. So glad that you're here with us. Parking lot looks really different, huh? Big green wall. Getting ready for uh, next weekend. Of course, this is Palm Sunday, and uh, we remember that God's plan is moving forward exactly on schedule. And if you recall that it was uh, that that Palm Sunday that our Lord sent these disciples ahead to to find things as he had predicted and to get that little cult and bring it back to Jesus where he would then make his way into Jerusalem. The people would throw down their coats and palm branches in, uh, in somewhat feigned worship of the king. Of course, this morning we know that he is king. Amen. And we are here to prepare our hearts, not just this morning for the week ahead, but as we also anticipate as we have been uh, next weekend, our Good Friday and Easter services. So let me just remind you that this Friday, uh, Good Friday service is 4 and 6 o'clock. There's no Thursday night service this week in case you were going to pick that. Uh, But Friday, 4 and 6, we won't have our tabernacle, but we will have our indoor health-sensitive venue and our family venue and of course online for those of you at home. So make plans to attend Good Friday and then of course Easter Sunday, uh, eight o'clock come for breakfast and fellowship together, nine o'clock our family service and then of course our baptisms after the service. And I'll just mention this for those of you that maybe have been holding out and are still thinking about baptism, it's not too late. There's actually gonna be a baptism class Uh, just the next hour so you could finish this service and then head over to classroom B where uh, you'll just hear the biblical teaching on baptism and uh, be prepped for the baptism on uh, Easter Sunday. And then lastly, before I pray for us, uh, Pastor Jim Sitzinger has started this evangelism class that will happen a bit on a rotation And you can sign up for the April classes and get into that cohort of sorts and uh, just sharpen your skills in thinking about sharing the good news of the gospel. And I hope that you are thinking this week about how you can invite people to hear the gospel, partner as a church family in inviting neighbors, coworkers, family, friends to come and join us as we celebrate uh, the risen Lord that we love and love talking about. And so why don't you stand as I, as, as I pray for us and then the worship team leads us in adoration this morning. Heavenly Father, we, we echo the words of that crowd. We trust with a sincere heart. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Our hearts are gripped by the reality of of what occurred 2,000 years ago. And our Lord, our Savior, your Son, headed to the cross, bearing our guilt, our shame, our sin, our judgment, clothing us in the robes of righteousness that we were so undeserving of, conquering sin and death that Easter morning. God, would you fill our hearts even now with anticipation, with expectation. As we sing, would you give us hearts full of humility and praise for the King of kings and Lord of lords, whom we love and who we worship now in spirit and in truth. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning, church. It's an honor to be with you this morning sing out to that great God, the one that we just prayed to. We who were lost in our sin, we were buried beneath our shame, yet he took pity on us out of his great love, that we could be called sons and daughters of righteousness. Out of his his great love, he gave us his blood and purified us. Let's sing about that great transaction that took place in our hearts. Sing this right out to him. I was buried. I was buried. My shame. This is what the Lord did. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn. He changed it all till I 
remain. Yes, he did. I was breathing, but not alive. And all my failures, I had tried to hide. It was my turn. Till when? Till I made. Come on, he called us out. You called my name. And I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name. And I ran out of that grave. Out of
God with us, Emmanuel. Declare this together. Our hope, our hope is in you. Come on, we declare. All our hope is in you, Jesus. All the glory to you, God. The light of the world. We sing. pray together. Amen. Jesus, we thank you so much that you are our only hope. All our hope is found in you, Lord. We sing about that in the, even in that first song uh, of your story of redemption to uh, each one of us who is found in you, Lord. The guilt, the shame, the darkness that our souls live in before you free us, Jesus. God, we thank you so much that you took pity on us. Um, God, that you would take a sinful man's uh, sin upon you, the punishment that we deserved, and that you would pour out your love on that cross, that we could be righteous before your throne, Lord. Jesus, thank you for that. Thank you that you are our only rescue, our only ransom. God, we um, just pray that as we sing this next song of that story of redemption, of the darkest day in history, the cost that you um, paid, Lord, on our behalf, I pray that our hearts would be softened, that you, Jesus, would reign on the rightful throne in our hearts this morning. We want to be uh, vessels for you, Jesus. We want to be surrendered fully to you. God, as we hail you as Lord, I pray that we would um, release things that um, we're keeping from you. 
any places of our hearts, Lord, that, that we haven't uh, fully surrendered to you, Lord. We want to declare you as Lord and as King and reigning over all things, even our hearts this morning. Do that work, we ask in your precious name, Jesus. Only you can do it. By your power and through your spirit, we ask this in that holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing of that dark day. There was a moment. There was a moment when the lights went out. When death had claimed its victory. The king of love had given up his life. The darkest day.
soak in this verse in Colossians 1. And then we'll sing to the preeminent one. our creator, our king, our Lord, our sovereign together. So good to proclaim that truth as a body of believers this morning. Amen. Why don't you take a seat? So good to worship with you this morning. Crossroads family. Last year, the pandemic stopped us from being able to celebrate Easter, but this year we are determined that that will not happen. So we are doing our best to plan and think of all that we can so that we can celebrate Easter weekend well as a church family. And some of you have had some questions. So let me take a moment and try to address a different question so you all feel comfortable and know exactly what is happening for Easter weekend. First of all, the, uh, the week leading into Easter and the week coming out of Easter, there are none of our weekly midweek ministries. So we take a break to focus on uh, coming into the Easter weekend. So make note of that. Secondly, uh, our Good Friday services are at four and six. And some of you have asked about RSVPing for that. We would love for you to do that. You can go online to uh, www.lifeatcrossroads.org slash Easter and reserve a spot. We are not having any of our outdoor seating, but we do provide childcare up to three years old. So please uh, reserve your indoor spot for our Good Friday service. Some of you have asked about parking. We're gonna be taking over the parking lot for our Easter Sunday service, but all of the surrounding parking that we normally have on a Sunday morning is available for you, so please uh, plan accordingly. Now for Easter morning, you don't need tickets, just come. Come at eight o'clock for our continental breakfast, that's free for all of you, and then our family service at nine o'clock. Uh, there are no childcare ministries, no next gen, but we will have our outdoor family tent that we traditionally would have set up there at COC. So come and bring your kids and be a part of the family tent here in our parking lot. And of course, stay uh, for our baptisms that will be happening at the end of the service as always a highlight of our Easter morning. Uh, maybe you've been thinking about coming back and this is the time we would love to have you be back on campus for our Easter service celebration. But we know some of you may not yet feel comfortable and would rather take advantage of the live stream and Easter and Good Friday will both be live streamed. So for those of you at home, you, you won't miss out on a thing. And lastly, uh, Pastor Jimmy's been asking the question, who's your one? Who are you praying about? Who are you thinking about? Who have you put on that paper and stuck in that uh, display there in the lobby? Uh, would you think about how you can invite that person to join us for Easter weekend? Of course, the goal of all of this is to worship our risen Lord and to make him known to Santa Clarita. And you get to be a part of that with us. Hope we've answered all of your questions. Of course, if you have other concerns, feel free to call us. We're here to serve you, and we look forward to celebrating Easter together.
Good morning, Crossroads. It is so good to be here with each of you this morning. Uh, we as a staff are so excited about this week. Uh, so excited as we remember back to what Jesus Christ accomplished, whether it was today, Palm Sunday, or through the Passion Week, certainly on Good Friday. Uh, as a child, I remember thinking, why do we call Good Friday Good Friday? But then as you learn of all that Jesus accomplished through his death on the cross, uh, it certainly was good for us as believers. And then Resurrection Sunday. Uh, let me just ask you to be praying with us. Uh, pray for the staff. First of all, there's a lot that goes into every part of this coming weekend. But let's be praying for those people in our life who we could invite, who we could encourage to show up, who we could encourage even just to watch the live stream uh, at home. We want to see the name of Jesus Christ go out through our valley, through our community. And so let's be praying and asking for his help, his blessing through all of that. If you would take your Bibles and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we have a lot of ground to cover this morning. I'm supposed to look at verse 1 through 22 with you. We probably won't make it that whole way, but we'll, we'll do our best working through this. Uh, as you turn there, I, I've been reminded in my life as I get older, as my kids get older, as I spend more time in ministry, uh, that there is truth in this statement. And the statement is this. There is a difference between hearing a warning and heeding a warning. Think about that with me. There's a difference, actually really a huge difference in life between simply hearing a warning and heeding the warning, being careful of the warning, changing what you're doing in light of what you have been told. One of the best examples of this in my life, several years ago, I went down to the island of St. Vincent in the Caribbean. My sister and brother-in-law were missionaries there for a year. You're like, ooh, sign me up for that job. Uh, they taught at a, a small Bible college, and I went down to visit them and help out for a time. And I was traveling with one of the missionaries out to this little village where we were going to speak at a church on a Sunday morning. And as we were driving out there, I noticed this pristine Caribbean beach. It had the blue sparkling water. It had the palm trees hanging out over the white sand. I mean, it was beautiful. It looked like it should have been on a calendar or a postcard. But there was no one swimming at the beach. There was no one even out there. And as we passed other beaches that week, I had noticed that same thing. A lot of beautiful beaches, but no one swimming in the water. And so I asked the missionary, I said, what, what's going on? I mean, if I lived here, I'd be out in that water every single day. Why don't you ever see people swimming in these beaches? And he said, well, the way the island was situated, both in the currents there in the Caribbean and in the way the island was set up, there were a lot of really bad riptides and currents there. And there was a sign you'll see up here on the screen, very similar to this one, right there at the edge of the beach, don't swim, don't swim, it's dangerous. And the missionary shared with me that actually just a few weeks before, there had been two young men from Germany. They were working, uh, helping people medically with a nonprofit who were actually headed out to the same village that we were headed to. And they had seen that same beach. They asked their taxi driver to stop. And they said, we're, we're just going to go out. We'll swim for a few minutes. And the taxi driver said, no, 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 no. You can't, you can't do that. Don't you see the sign? There's really bad currents here. There's a reason no one's swimming in the water. And the guys thought, we're young men, we're fit, we're in shape, we know how to swim. We'll, we'll go out a little ways, and if it's bad, we'll come back in, but we'll, we'll be fine. So sure enough, they went out in the water a little ways and seemed fine. They could handle it. So they went out a little further, and everything seemed fine. They could handle it. And of course, you can guess where the story's going. They went out too far, and by the time they noticed the current, it was too late. They were swept away and they, they drowned that day. I think what, what makes this story even more tragic is that the taxi driver himself, the one who had warned them, the one who had pleaded with them and said, don't go out there, don't go out there, don't go out there, he went out and tried to rescue them. And he also drowned that day. You see, folks, there's, there's a difference in life between hearing the warning and heeding the warning. It's easy to hear the warnings, it's hard many times to heed them. And this morning, as we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is going to give us a warning. 
It's a warning that he's aware of in his own life, a warning that he wants to give to these new Corinthian believers, and a warning that we can learn an example from. We're going to start actually in chapter 9, though, because Paul's going to talk about how he's careful himself to heed this warning. What's going on in chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 10 is Paul's telling the Corinthians how they ought to live their life as new believers in front of all the unbelievers in their life. He's saying to them, you've been changed. You, you, you've been saved by the gospel. So be careful how you live in front of the unbelievers, the non-believers, so, so you can witness to them, so you can minister to them or point them to the gospel. Look in verse number 19 of chapter 9. He says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all. Why? That I might win more of them. He goes, I submit. If I'm in this type of situation, I submit. Why? Because that's what I believe or that's how I think I need to live. No, I submit because I don't want to create a stumbling block for the gospel. When I'm with the Jews, I become like a Jew that I might win the Jews, he goes on. When I'm with those who are weak or those who are strong or those who are under the law, I become like that, not because he's a chameleon, not because he's two-faced in any way. He becomes like that so he can win those people to Christ. Look at how he ends that section in verse 23. I do it all. I do it all, all of this, for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. He says, the way I act, the way I submit, the way I work with others, my key here, the reason why I do it is so that they may come to the gospel. Look at verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Listen, we're all running a Christian race. We're, we as believers are all living in front of unbelievers. But don't just run the race. Don't just do that like someone who rolls off the couch and then expects to do well in the competition. Live your life purposely. Live in such a way that you can do well in your example before others. Verse 27, but I discipline my body. I am rigorous about what I do. And I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul says, the worst possible thing would be for me to do all of this, to witness and share and point people to Jesus and, and develop relationships and then do something that messes that all up. We all, if you've been in church any matter of time, we all are familiar with people who have pursued the Christian life or pursued ministry and then done something to mess up their testimony in front of others. When Paul uses the word disqualified here, I don't think he's saying disqualified from salvation. Okay, I don't think he's saying, I don't, I don't wanna do all this and then mess up and lose my salvation. I think what he's saying there is, I don't wanna be disqualified from service. I don't want to do anything that would take me out of ministering to others or pointing them to the Lord. Well, we know that when we hear a warning, one of the best examples or ways to understand the warning is to see it played out in someone else's life. Okay, again, if you're a parent or if you've been ever mentoring someone, you can warn them, warn them, warn them. But the most effective way is to say, well, let's look at this person's life. Let's see what they did. Let's see the consequences of their actions, and then you decide if you want to do that. And so in chapter 10, Paul is going to give us an example of how this warning, the warning to not be disqualified, was played out in the Old Testament. Look at what it says, verse 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. What? What does that mean? And I, I get a little excited here, okay? Some of you guys know I minister to the children, and then I also work with the college students. And with the kids, we spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. So when we're going through a passage in the New Testament that refers to the Old Testament, I get a little excited because there's some great stories in the Old Testament. Paul is going to take us back to the Old Testament. So for the rest of our time this morning, put on your Old Testament like Sunday school, VBS, Awana, put on, put on that thinking cap and let's go back. 
They were all under the cloud. What is Moses talking, or sorry, what is Paul talking about? Hint, Moses, okay? <laughs> the Exodus. And what he's going to do is through these next few verses, take us back to the time of the Exodus and use that time as an example for us. They were under the cloud. They enjoyed the presence of God. What does that mean? Well, think back. So you have the children of Israel. They're in the land of Egypt for 400 years as slaves. And they're suffering. And they're struggling. And the book of Exodus starts out, they're pleading with God, Lord, would you help us just deliver us? Get us out of here. And so what does God do? In Exodus chapter 2, Moses shows up in the story. And God does this phenomenal work in Moses' life. He grows up in the court of Pharaoh. He's taken out into the wilderness for 40 years. He sees this burning bush that isn't burning away. And he talks to God. And God says, go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, do you remember the statement? Let my people go. Okay, and in my mind, I think Charlton Heston there. I don't know if anyone else remembers that. But here's Moses. He goes back to Egypt and God works. You have the plagues, you have the Passover. And what does Pharaoh do? He eventually lets God's people go. And so they go out into the wilderness, the desert, the Sinai Peninsula. And, and what does God do? The first thing he does is he shows up in the form of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God is right there with them. And, and I think of this as a dad. I can just imagine, you know, your little kid has a nightmare, bad dream, daddy, daddy. And you come and you take him by the shoulders and you peel back the, the, the front of your tent and you point to that cloud or you point to that pillar of fire. You say, buddy, you have nothing to be worried about. God is right here with us, with his people. Everything's going to be okay. Man, imagine that. They have the presence of God, the visible manifestation of God right with them. But that's not it. That verse goes on to say they all passed through the sea. Now tell me you remember this story. Okay, the crossing of the Red Sea. This is like one of the highlights of Sunday school. Okay, they're leaving the land of Egypt. The cloud is guiding them. And oh, the cloud makes a mistake. Not, not really. But the cloud guides them to the edge of the sea. And they're like, uh, wait, what are we doing here? We, we, we don't have boats to get through. It's too far to swim across. We got granny and the baby. Like, what are we doing here? And then things get worse. Because you can almost imagine the yells and the shout from the back of the group. The Egyptians are coming. The Egyptians are coming. And you could turn around and see this cloud of dust as all the chariots of the Egyptians chase down the children of Israel. And they have nowhere to go. They can't cross the sea. They're stuck. But what does God do? They experience the protection of God. Moses puts his rod there into the sea. The waters part for them. And, and as I studied this, and I, I went down the rabbit hole studying this this week. This was fascinating. These, these walls of water that would have swept up on either side, they weren't like 20 feet high or 30 feet high. We're like, oh, maybe the height of the ceiling in here. Man, they were probably the height of some of the skyscrapers in downtown L.A. I mean, these walls of water were massive. What God does here was a miracle unlike anything else. And the children of Israel go down into it. And I can just imagine, again, as a dad, my kids, like, splashing with the water. You're like, stop touching the water. You're going to mess this all up. Okay, and you're bringing them through. And then how does God finish that moment? Just as the children of Israel go through, the Egyptians go down in, and the walls of water come crashing down. And God says to them, the Egyptians that you saw this day will trouble you no more. They're free. They're free. God protected them. God handled it all for them. But what else did he do for them? They were baptized into Moses, the next verse says. He says this, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, baptized into Moses. We, we, we think salvifically on that. All that Paul's saying is, when you're baptized, you're saying, I identify with the leadership of Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. I will follow him. Their leader was Moses. And, and for us, we're like, okay, Moses, cool. That's great. No, 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 no. For, for, for a Jewish person, even today, Moses is at the top of the greatest leaders of all time. 
They didn't have just any leader. The person that God had put in their lives to lead them was one of the the greatest leaders, Christian or secular, amazing, amazing man. But not only did they have that, it says they ate the same spiritual food, verse three and four. They ate the same spiritual food. The word spiritual there, again, isn't some nebulous, like, oh, what, what is that? It just means heavenly or supernatural. What was the spiritual food? You remember the manna? I love the manna. They're out in the desert, and, well, there's no Albertsons, there's no Ralphs, no Vons. There's not really convenient places to feed that many people. And so what does God do? Well, one morning they wake up, and they open the flap of their tent, and there's these white bread-like, flake-like flakes all, all, all over the ground. And they scoop them up, and they taste them, and the Bible says they were sweet. They tasted like honey. And every single day from that day until they got to the borders of the promised land, except on the Sabbath, you had to gather twice as much on Fridays. But every single day, you open the flap of your tent, food. Yeah, but I'm hungry, food. How much does it cost? Free. How often will God do this? Every day. He'll just provide and provide and provide. Man, what a good God. And finally, it says they all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. The rock was Christ. Well, you don't only need food in the desert. You need water. And again and again, God's power provided water for them. Whether it was through Moses striking the rock and water comes out, or if he's to talk to the rock and have the water come out, God's power provides over and over for them, for their animals, for 40 years. And when it says the rock followed them and the rock was Christ, it doesn't mean an actual physical rock. It's saying Jesus Christ, the source of living water, was with them every step of the way. Man, God's so good. And I I would argue with you that no other generation watched God work again and again and again in such miraculous ways, except maybe the disciples. So these people who saw all this happen, they must have been super spiritual, right? They must have been like these paragons of faith and trust in the Lord. They watched him do this and watch him do that and watch him do that. What does verse five say? Nevertheless, despite all that God did, in spite of everything he accomplished out of his love and care for them, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. And that's a bit of an understatement right there. With every single one of them except Joshua and Caleb, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Why wasn't God pleased with them? Well, what's our warning? Our warning is don't be disqualified. These children of Israel who saw God work in such miraculous ways time after time, they were called to be a light to the other nations. They weren't just to uh, avoid every, everyone else and stay away from everyone else. They were called time and time again, beginning all the way back when God appeared to Abraham, that he and his descendants would be a blessing to all people. The children of Israel were supposed to be distinct so that other nations would look at them and be like, wow, there's something different about them. Their God like, actually shows up and does things. Their, their God was present with them. Their God provides for them. We pray to our God again and again, and nothing happens. Man, they they just live differently than everyone else. They were supposed to be a light. They were supposed to be something that everyone else could look at and go, man, I want to be like that. I want that God in my life. And what happened? They ended up being just like everyone else. They ended up being no different than the other nations around them. There were four ways these Israelites were disqualified. And these four ways that they were disqualified are warnings for us, warnings to keep us from being disqualified. How were they disqualified? Verse number six. Now, these things took place as an example. Okay, we're to learn from them. Why do we look back at the Old Testament? We're to learn from those examples. They're examples that we might not desire evil as they did. How did they desire evil? Number one, do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Idolatry. 
They were idolaters. Idolatry is this, preferring another God. They preferred a different God, another God. The story is found in Exodus 32. We don't have time to go back, but if you want to go back later, it's the story of the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai should have been this high point for the children of Israel. God had done this and this and this and brought them there. And then what happens at Mount Sinai? God comes down to the mountain to give the people of Israel his perfect law, a law that was designed for them to have a society different than everyone else, a society that looked to God as their leader, a society with rules that were good for them to protect them. And so Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and he's meeting with God and Exodus 32 says the people start wondering where Moses is. He's been gone for a long time. And they're waiting and they're waiting. They think maybe he died up there. And so they get a hold of Aaron and they say to Aaron, Moses' brother, Aaron, make us gods for us to worship. You're like, Moses has only been gone, you know, days, weeks at this time and they're already leaving God for other gods? And you think, well, Aaron, Moses' brother, he's going to have his back, okay? He's going to be like, no, 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 my brother's coming back. We're going to worship the one true God. What does he do? He goes, okay, I'll do that. Give me your gold. Give me your rings. Give me your earrings, your necklaces, all those things. He melts them down into this golden cow. Now, when I tell the kids that, they're like, they could make any God, and they chose a cow. Okay, they're going to worship a cow, but that's what they did. They, they have this golden cow, and they begin to worship the golden cow. And what do they say about that golden cow? This is shocking. They say, ah, our gods that brought us up out of Egypt, they give a golden cow credit for everything that God had done. How do you think God felt about that? And God is there on the mountain giving these rules, these good rules to Moses, and he stops and he says, Moses, the people have already turned away from me. Go down to the people. So Moses takes the tablets. He goes down. He meets Joshua halfway, and they stop, and they hear something. <laughs> and Joshua's like trying to give the people the benefit of the doubt. He's like, maybe they're at war. And Moses goes, that doesn't sound like a war to me. And they go down the mountain, and you can imagine they come around the corner, and there are the people of Israel in the midst of this great wickedness and debauchery around this golden cow. See why God was angry with them? Why he brought judgment on them? He had done so much for them. And like that, they preferred other things. Well, what about the Corinthians? For them, they, they'd grown up in societies that worshiped idols. That was what they were used to. That was their culture. And so for them, they, they had been saved by Jesus and changed by Jesus. But now, man, they're tempted to go back. They're tempted to open the door a little way. And really, that's what, that's what verse 14 through 22 is talking about. They just, they want to put their foot back in the pool of idolatry. And Paul's saying, how can you do that? He said, Corinthians, you, you've told your brothers and your parents and your kids about the goodness of God. And after telling them about everything God's done for you, you're gonna go like, well, maybe the idols weren't so bad. Uh, maybe we'll spend a little time at the temples. Uh, maybe we'll, no way. Now for us, we, we, we can look at that and go, well, I don't have any little golden cows in my house that I worship. I don't have any wood carvings stuck in a corner that we bow down to every day. But in America, we do have plenty of other gods. We have plenty of things that call for our time and our money and our effort and energy that demand our attention that we prefer above God. It can be our, our kids in our valley. Man, it could be our kids' athletics. It can be our, 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 school, our, our schools and hopes for college for them. It can be our 401ks, our savings, our, our stocks. It can be the square footage of our house. These other things that we put so much into. And man, we tell people, I love God, and man, he's so good, and you should come to church. And they're watching us and going, man, if God's so great, why do you spend all your time with this instead of with God? If your God is so good, why don't you ever talk about him? Instead, you talk about this and this and this and that new boat you got and this and that. 
we prefer so quickly other things and we disqualify the testimony, the witness that we've had with others. What's the second area? Disqualified through immorality. Disqualified through immorality. Look at verse number eight. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. Man, that, that's brutal. 23,000 die like that. This must have been bad. Well, it was. In Numbers chapter 25, God has given his law. He's been very clear how he feels about immorality and all the different forms that that takes. And yet, as the children of Israel get to the land of Moab, the men of Israel pursue the women of Moab. In another generation, my, my grandma would have called them loose women. I remember as a kid, I'm like, what does that mean? Okay. But this terrible wickedness goes all through the camp. And in fact, if you go back and look at the text, there's this Israelite man who very publicly takes this Moabite woman and is willing to sin in front of the whole camp. And God is angry. Again, the Corinthians would have, would have understood this. Todd has been clear. The immorality that took place in Corinth was almost unlike any other city in the Roman Empire. It was awful. Temple prostitutes and people coming in from all these other nations, there was no morals whatsoever. And these new believers, man, that was, that was life. That was how things worked. That was, and they go, maybe I can mess around with it. Maybe I can wait out a little way and I'll be fine. I'll be able to control it. God says, stay away from it. Flee immorality. What about our society? We, we wouldn't know any of that in our society. Man, we, we live in a society, the air we breathe is full of immorality. I tell our college students, when, when I was young, I would have had to work if I wanted to look at pornography. Now you have to work to avoid pornography. It's all around us. And for us as the church to say we love Jesus and then pursue immoral things totally disqualifies anything we have to say in front of the unbelieving world. And for most of us, man, we, we love the Lord and we want to do what's right. And it's not like we're, we're just jumping into adultery or things like that. But what tends to happen inside the church is we put our, our, our toe in the water of immorality. We're willing to, to flirt just a little bit with our coworker. We're willing to extend the touch a little bit or a touch that's totally unnecessary with someone who is not our spouse. We're, we're willing to spend a little extra time with a person and just let our minds think about what could happen. God says it's wrong, it's wrong. And what we've seen time after time after time in the church is someone who waited out a little ways, didn't heed the warning, was like, oh, this is okay, I can handle it. And waited out a little further and thought, oh, this is okay, I can handle it. And then finds themselves swept away. And they're disqualified in their ministry to others because of it. Look at the third thing. Disqualified through testing God. Disqualified through testing God. I was like, oh, what, what does that mean, testing God? It's in verse number nine. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Now, if you remember the Old Testament, you remember the serpents, okay? The Israelites get themselves in trouble and God sends snakes into the camp as a little kid. That terrified me. Okay, but God, through Moses, raised up a bronze snake on a pole, and anyone who looked to that snake could find healing. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. But I'm studying this, and I'm going, what, what actually led to that? What is he talking about? If you look at Numbers chapter 21, the beginning of the chapter, the children of Israel fight another battle with some enemies, and God gives them this great victory. You're like, man, God does it again. And as soon as they get back to camp, they start complaining. They say, we have no food. We have no water. And the food that we have is worthless. Now, now think about what they said. We have no food, but the food we have is worthless. Have you ever heard that in your home? There's nothing to eat. And you're like, I just looked in the cupboard 10 minutes ago. It's full of stuff to eat. It, it's, it's like what happens with our children. And parents, you, you understand this. You have a long day at work. 
a rough day at work, you're coming home and you think, ah, I don't know what to make for dinner. You know what? I'll just stop at the store, take my time, take my money, buy some good stuff for dinner. You get home, you prepare this nutritious, delicious dinner for your family. You sit them down, you're ready to serve them. And just as you scoop the dinner out, your child goes, ew, gross, I don't want that. Are you kidding me, kid? You don't know everything it took to make this meal for you. Imagine that with God. God feeds them every day. Good food right there at their door, free for them to eat every single day. Ah, this is worthless. See how that might have tested God? We're disqualified through testing God when we strain the patience of God. What does that mean? It's when we want to push the edges of God's mercy and grace. It's when we want to get as close to the things of the world as we can without quite crossing that line. And what happens in our life when we do that? What happens is we look just like the world. We watch the same movies that the world watches. And they're talking about movies. You're like, oh yeah, I saw that. And they go, you, you're a Christian. You, you watch that? Years ago when I had my very first job, I was a busboy at a restaurant. And I remember before, before even starting there, I was just praying, Lord, I know I'm gonna be around a lot of unsaved people. Would you help me just to be a witness? And I remember there was a waitress, her name was Patty. She was just really sweet to all the younger workers there. And so we, we developed a friendship. I invited her to our church. She came with our family one time, with her family. And a few weeks after that, we're sitting around the break room, just in, enjoying a few minutes before we go back out onto our shift. And people are telling jokes, and they're off color, and they're, they're raunchy. And I remember I, I shared something. It wasn't terrible. I didn't swear. I didn't, but it, but it, was ra- it, it was raunchy. It was off color. And I remember Patty looking at me. And I remember being kind of weirded out by the way she was looking at me. I said, I said what? What? She goes, oh, no, no, I just know you're a Christian. I didn't think you would say that. <sighs> Ouch. See, in that moment, I wanted to be as much like the world as I could be. I wanted to feel accepted by them. I didn't want to be different. I wanted to push the boundaries of what I could say. And in the end, I ended up looking just like the world. Listen, our, our friends and loved ones don't need Christians who look just like every unsaved person. They need Christians in their life who look different, who act different, who speak differently, who exalt Jesus Christ. Don't be disqualified in your testimony by trying to be as much like the unsaved world as you can be. Here's the last one, disqualified through grumbling. Through grumbling. Now, when I read that, I I paused for a moment because idolatry is really bad. And immorality is really bad, and testing God's really bad, but grumbling doesn't seem like that, that bad. Look what it says in verse number 10. It says, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Destroyed by the destroyer sounds pretty bad. What happened? Numbers chapter 14, it's the story where the Israelites had made it just to the border of Israel, the promised land, this land that God has promised to give them. And what do they do? They send 12 spies into the land. The spies come back and the spies go, hey, good news, bad news. Good news is their grapes are huge. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's an amazing land. Bad news is giants and big walled cities. And we're never gonna be able to beat them. So let's just give up now. And Joshua and Caleb go, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, yeah, they're giants. Yes, there's walled cities, but we have God on our side. And man, have you noticed the things that God has been able to do? If we have God with us, we'll we'll have the victory. But the people grumble and complain and grumble and complain to the point that God goes, you know what? Fine. You don't want the promised land? Fine. You're going to wander in the desert for 40 years because you didn't want to take the good thing that I offered to give you. For the Corinthians, man, they, they'd been saved and their lives had been changed. But you, what you see in these chapters are like, eh, but I miss this. Eh, but I'd like to go back to that. I mean, I thought this was gonna be so good, but actually being a Christian is kind of hard. What does it say to your unbelieving friends 
when on one day you're like, man, God's so good, and I believe he's sovereign, he's in control of everything in my life, and I just trust him, and the next day you're like, oh man, my life's terrible. That doesn't exalt our Lord. You're going, well, I thought your God was good. If your life's terrible, my life's terrible. Why should I want to change anything? It disqualifies us. It disqualifies us. Look at verse number 12. Therefore, due to all of this, due to this example of these people who saw more of God than anyone else and how they were disqualified, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. As I studied this, I thought, well, I mean, yeah, this is a good warning, but we, we got a good church. We're well taught by, by the word of God. We have good, strong doctrine. We serve, we've got strong marriages, we've got strong ministries. I mean, we're, we're doing pretty well. Take heed. Be careful. Don't just hear the warning. Follow the warning. Take heed to the warning. If any man thinks he stands, if you're going, yeah, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Oh, brother, sister, be careful lest we fall in this. Now look at verse 13. Here's the good news. Paul ends this section with the good news. He says this, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Okay, that word temptation, we, we look at that and our tendency is to assume the negative. Oh, like being led into sin. That word, it really isn't negative. It's a neutral word. It means no time of testing has happened in your life. This test can go one of two ways. Let, let me give you a hypothetical situation to help us think through this. Let's say your boss emails you this, this afternoon. You're leading a group to go on a, a business trip out of town. You're going to be gone for three nights. Now, that's not bad or good. You're just going to be out of town at a hotel by yourself for three nights. That situation could be really good. Or that situation could be really bad. That's the temptation, the testing. So you're being put into this situation, but the good news is they're common to man. None of you are facing something that's unique, that's crazy, that no one else has ever been through. But what does Satan do? He makes us think like, I'm the only one. I'm the only one struggling with this. So many times I counsel guys in my office and they're like, hey, I gotta share with you. And they share something. I go, yeah, I just talked to three guys in the last month who struggle with the same thing. Like, it's just common. We're, we're all in this together. We're all going through this. But look at the next part. But God is faithful. Look, you're being put in this situation. And one, God is there with you in this situation, just like he is with all believers who have gone through this situation. But what else? He will not let you tempted beyond your ability. That's a double-sided coin. Hey, there's good news there. The good news is, God will not bring into your life any testing that you through his grace cannot handle. Okay, every testing in your life, you through Jesus Christ could have victory. So what does that mean when you don't have victory? It's not God's fault. It's something in you. It's that pursuit of evil. It's that desire for evil. But guess what? With the temptation. God will also make a way of escape. Okay, there is a way through it. Look at the last phrase, that you might be able to endure it. The answer is, that, is not that God gives us an escape hatch. You're like, oh man, the last time I went away on a business trip, I was gone from my family. I just, I struggled in some areas. I fell in some areas. God, would you just like cancel the trip? Some, sometimes God does that. But most of the time, God goes, no, you're going on this trip, but you can get through it. You can honor me in it. And, and I want you to think about this, folks. As you would go on a business trip, or maybe as you deal with your company's money, or maybe as you're responding to an argument in your family, or whatever the situation of testing is, there is a way to go through it that's honoring to the Lord, and there's a way to go through it that could disqualify you in your ministry to others. Again, let's say you go on that trip, you're there, you have a great work day. On the first day, you go back to your hotel, and in the late evening, there's a knock on the door. You open it up, it's one of your coworkers. They say, hey, a uh, bunch of us are going out, we're, we're having a good time tonight. You wanna come out with us? 
You're put in this situation where things could go one of two ways. You can either answer in a way that is true to the character that Christ is developing in you. Say, you know what? I'm going to stay here. I'm going to call my wife, tell her how much I love her, call my kids, tell them good night. I'm just going to head to bed early. Have you ruined your testimony there? No. You've solidified your marriage there. You've shown the importance of the kids that God has given you. Or you could say, you know what? Let me grab my coat. We're going to have a good time. And you could go out and do things that as your coworkers who know you are a Christian look at you, they go, that's the way Christians act? Why is he or she any different than me? Don't be disqualified. Let me look at one other verse with you. Turn to Hebrews chapter four. Hebrews chapter four If you haven't noticed, we won't get to verses 14 through 22. Paul just gives a a deeper example with idolatry there. But look at Hebrews chapter 4, very end of the chapter. There's no temptation taken us, but what is common to man and God is faithful, who will also with the temptation make a way of escape that we might be able to endure it. But what if you failed? What if you're sitting here this morning and you're not thinking forward to how you can honor the Lord and point your friends to Christ, but maybe you're thinking back this morning to ways that you've blown it, ways that you've messed up. Listen, we serve a good God. We've been going through Hebrews in our college group summit on Sunday nights, and this, this passage was so helpful to me in my study. Look at verse number 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. One of the reasons Jesus Christ came to earth, put on flesh, was so he could walk through every type of thing that we are faced with. Just as there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, Jesus Christ walked through every type of temptation. And you need to know, he did it without sin. You go, well, that's nice, because I, I sure sin plenty. Look at the hope in verse number 16. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You're in a situation, you face something, you failed. Maybe you know you, you've hurt your testimony in front of others who don't know Christ. Guess what? We have a high priest named Jesus Christ who came to earth and went through everything like we've gone through. And what does he do? He says, you draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, knowing that despite your sin, despite your failure, despite your struggles, you will find mercy and grace there to help in time of need. We serve a God who loves us, who forgives us, who restores us. We serve a God of second chances. And you have the opportunity through Christ to find his love, his mercy, and his grace at the foot of the cross. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, maybe it's even been on our hearts to invite certain people Friday or Sunday to just talk about the real meaning behind Easter. And yet maybe for some here this morning, they're wondering, how can I even talk about Easter? I've blown it big time. I lost my temper with my employees and I certainly didn't look like a Christian. I acted this way in a meeting or with my neighbors and I, I know I didn't reflect Christ. I pushed boundaries that I know I shouldn't push just to, to be like everyone else. Lord, would you help us to find mercy and grace at the throne of Christ. Lord, would you help us not to disqualify our witness, not to do anything that would put a stumbling block between others who we love and care for dearly and the cross. Lord, would you help us 
to, to have seen your presence in our lives and felt your power and your protection, your provision, all your goodness, and be different because of that. And to point to friends and neighbors that the hope that is found only in Jesus Christ. Would you help us this week? Lord, I, I pray as well very specifically for the ones that all of us have thought of, prayed about, that they would hear your word this week through us, through Todd, uh, through the messages, the singing, and that they would see their need for you. We love you, Lord. We thank you. May we honor you in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we will have uh, prayer counselors to, to pray with you, to talk with you if you're wrestling with something. The worst thing you could do this morning is walk out those doors and forget what the Holy Spirit maybe has laid on your heart here. Deal with it now. Talk to someone now. Find help now. We love you, Crossroads. You're loved. You're dismissed this morning. Stay faithful.